Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Berlin Foreign Policy Forum 2020. In cooperation with the German Marshall Fund of the United States, it is my great pleasure to welcome Ambassador Samantha Power and Karen Donfried, President of the GMF, for a discussion on the U.S. role in the world. Good morning to Washington and thank you for joining us. To get us in the mood, let me quote a survey result from this year's Berlin Pulse, our annual survey. We asked Germans after the U.S. elections in November what they think about their future relationship with the U.S. 51% said Germany should become more independent from the U.S. 45% said Germany should continue to rely on the U.S. What is the right approach? We are looking forward to your thoughts. And with this, over to you, Karen Donfried. Thanks so much. It is such a pleasure to be part of the Körper Stiftung's wonderful Berlin Foreign Policy Forum, and it is a particular joy to moderate this conversation about the U.S. role in the world with Ambassador Samantha Power. She is well known to all of you. She currently is a professor of practice at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Law School, and she served with distinction as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations in the Obama administration. And obviously, Ambassador Power, a lot has happened over the three weeks that have elapsed since the U.S. presidential election. Yesterday, President-elect Biden announced his foreign policy team, including Secretary of State Tony Blinken, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. These are folks you know very well. What do these appointments tell you about what Germany can expect from the foreign policy of this incoming administration. Uh, thank you so, so much, Karen, and thanks for moderating this conversation. And every question you pose, I'm gonna, you know, deep down I'm gonna want your answer to the same question, uh, of course. Um, I, I feel uh, so grateful just as a citizen that the individuals named yesterday have agreed to take on the sacrifice uh, that they have agreed to take on. I cannot think of uh, a better set of individuals if you go one by one and we could talk about a couple of them, but also the combination. Um, I think it is gonna be just a warm gust of air that wafts across the Atlantic. Um, but to, and I should say that I was texting with one of them this morning, the, the big announcement is later, uh, is, is occurring uh, later this afternoon uh, with the president elect. And I wasn't sure uh, what kind of song music to recommend to this person who happens to be a close personal friend. And I was torn between you two, it's a beautiful day and this sort of sense of new possibility and promise and Johnny Cash's ring of fire. <laughs> I fell into a burning ring of fire. So I was going back and forth and saying, I'm not sure exactly how to think about this, but it just does underscore the, the large hole that America finds itself in, in Europe uh, in particular, but of course not only in Europe. So to say a word about a few of them, I think um, each and every one, um, and let's emphasize Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor who will coordinate the interagency process, who will have a huge amount to do with deciding on how to prioritize among a series of really, really difficult challenges. Um, Tony Blinken, who's the former deputy secretary, who'll be the secretary of state, the public face of American diplomacy and re-engagement around the world. Linda Thomas-Greenfield, uh, a longtime foreign service officer with a particular uh, background in Africa, but somebody who's mere, where the mere announcement of the individual just uh, sent such a signal to the experts and the people of great competence who have been so marginalized over the course of the last four years, because this is a signal uh, that Joe Biden wants that expertise, whether language expertise, whether it is ties to Africa or those ties to Europe, uh, where people's relationships go way back. That's what he wants around him in order to be able to craft, uh, again, the most uh, strategically valuable, but also uh, the most humane and rigorous uh, foreign policy that he can. On Europe specifically, I think both Jake and Tony, uh, you know, have the whole set of relationships that most people in these positions have to start building uh, on day one, or at least building from. I mean, you know, over the course of the last, in Tony's case, three decades, in, in Jake's case, uh, nearly two decades, uh, these are, are deep, deep ties. There's a also a recognition, I think, in the team that the transatlantic relationship 
it pr- was probably always need to have and not nice to have, but it ha- now has that tenor in a kind of urgent way. And, and I say this knowing that in the Obama years, uh, some felt slighted by the so-called pivot to Asia. Some felt that it was something that came at the expense of the centrality of transatlantic ties. And I think that because of China's rise, but also because of the recognition of how important shared values are as a foundation for collaboration, I think that the transatlantic relationship uh, becomes central to achieving just about everything on the Biden-Harris to-do list in the realm, not only of national security, but frankly, in the realm, in the varied realms uh, that overlap with uh, domestic policy, like the financial recovery that has to be a global financial recovery in order for our economy to recover, like the p- global vaccine distribution, which has to be done alongside vaccinating the German, French, Irish, and other European publics and, and the American public. But also we all have an interest in ensuring that developing countries get access uh, to the vaccine. And that's something that we're going to have to collaborate on together. Migration and developing a shared approach again to that. Uh, we've each, it's been each man for himself, each country for himself, uh, I think since President Obama left the White House. And so there's not a single issue in a way that you can think about tackling climate change, another one the top of the list, that you can think of tackling without rolling up our sleeves and transparently and accountably uh, and reliably and in a trustworthy way, sitting down with our European friends uh, to chart a path forward. Path forward. Thanks. And you spoke there about the interaction between foreign policy and domestic policy. And President-elect Biden has been clear in saying that we can only be strong abroad if we are united at home. And we've heard him talk about a foreign policy for the middle class. What does he mean by that? He has uh, made that point about the importance of domestic unity and solidarity, but also this, the importance of the domestic foundation for any leadership that we show abroad. So in the same way that President Trump has really undermined our, cl- our standing generally, but specifically our, our credibility on issues related to human rights when he attacks the media at home or when he tries to take steal an election that he didn't win you know these kinds of small things that have happened over the course of the of the last 4 years um you know that undermines our ability then to stand up against the building of concentration camps and the incarceration of the uyghurs or to stand up to nicolas maduro who's really destroying so much of what uh venezuelans had come to expect in terms of just basic state functionality uh, and, and health and, and social and economic welfare. We just, we just don't have the, the, the clout because of the chaos within our own borders and because again of the uh, undermining of democratic institutions. So I think part of what Biden means is let's start at home, let's rebuild those foundations, let's show ourselves first and then the world as well that we are competent again, that we tell the truth again, that we reach across the aisle. We hope there'll be another hand extending back in the other direction. I don't think there's any guarantee of that, but that if anybody's gonna uh, leave it all on the field in trying uh, to enlist that bipartisan cooperation, it's going to be Joe Biden. And then I think to your point about a foreign policy for the middle class, it is the case that recognizing the economic fallout from globalization, for lack of a better word, that Biden really is looking at foreign policy also in the other direction. So yes, our strong domestic foundation uh, is the platform from which we hope to lead again internationally and collaboratively, but at the same time that our it's our foreign policy that's going to be reinforcing our domestic uh, agenda or the, or the president-elect's domestic agenda. And so concretely, that means, of course, looking at uh, trade relationships and potential trade deals with an eye to what the effect of those deals are going to be on working Americans. It means understanding that the urgently overdue transition to clean energy needs to occur. uh, And it needs to occur in a manner 
that doesn't leave whole segments of the American uh, you know, working class or working people and, and middle class behind. And that's why I think one of the most compelling features of Biden's platform in the race itself was actually making climate change central to his economic recovery plan. So it's not about just going and depositing uh, your paperwork back in the Paris Climate Agreement receptacle, right? It's about, uh, of course, curbing emissions, but doing so in a manner that's very attentive, uh, again, to the to the economic recovery that's that's necessary, and seeing these new jobs as vital, uh, as additive, not as zero sum, which is the way in which climate and economic growth have often been uh, been treated as being kind of oppositional or you gain one at the expense of the other. Uh, th this uh, president-elect views it in entirely different terms. And I would be remiss as we talk about the U.S. role in the world, not to mention that you have just written a compelling article called The Can-Do Power about the United States and its role in the world. And you suggest in that article that the Biden administration should pursue foreign policy initiatives that can quickly highlight the return of American expertise and competence. Can you share those initiatives that you propose with our audience? Great, well, I, I have my list. I think others will have ideas as well in this very specific space of what are the kinds of things that America could do in light of the poll numbers we just heard about and that we're all familiar with in terms of America's favorability rating, trust rating, views of America's handling of the pandemic up to this point, um, which are not <laughs> favorable reviews. And, and believe me, as and, and I'm sure you feel the same way, Karen, as people who live in the United States, uh, it is uh, it makes your head spin, really, just just how it can be that with this amount of suffering in terms of the number of families who have been affected, who, as, as Biden likes to say, won't have people at the Thanksgiving dinner table who they would have had uh, a year ago. And then the economic devastation uh, that is following in the wake of the pandemic. Um, the fact that this has not so many months into the opportunity to handle it and wrestle it to ground but the fact that there's still no coherent messaging, still no real prioritization of the welfare of Americans. It, you know, for Americans, it, it's it's devastating and bewildering still. And, and I know for foreign publics that are not in the muck of our polarization and our uh, political um, scrum, uh, it must be completely cause head scratching. How can the country of Silicon Valley and of Henry Ford and Steve Jobs and the man on the moon and the Berlin airlift, uh, to say the least, how can that country be the country with these kinds of per capita infection and death rates? Um, so that's the backdrop, I think, in which Biden takes office. And the, the sort of criteria, I think, in terms of thinking about restoring America's reputation for competence as a foundation for restoring American legitimacy, perceptions of legitimacy and trust, and then as a foundation for building coalitions and solving problems together, actually, I mean, all of these kind of go together because you've got to build that underlying trust in these partnerships in order to be able to build the larger coalitions. So I think that the, the prime candidates are ones that have an overlap with the president-elect's domestic agenda, not least because large initiatives will have to be sold to the American people that potentially also to, if it, if it ends up being a Republican controlled Senate, the budgetary implications of course um, need to be thought through. So with a domestic nexus, which will have resonance in the public imagination, but also potentially generate more, more a greater likelihood at least of bipartisan support, produce results that meet a felt need uh, internationally. So, you know, we hear a lot, Karen, I know in the circles you and I travel about the return to the liberal and international order and even abstract ideas like the return of U.S. leadership, that doesn't meet anybody really where they are in the world. And it certainly doesn't have an intrinsic constituency beyond the kind of think tank circuit, perhaps, uh, you know, that, that you and I may frequent from time to time. So the candidates that met those criteria for me that I thought would be very compelling to out the gate to kind of start with 
are first, uh, of course, to join uh, our European friends and most countries in the world in the COVAX initiative at the World Health Organization, uh, facilitating, helping spearhead the distribution of vaccines to developing countries, to poor countries. And again, the nexus with our domestic fate is that the U.S. economy uh, cannot recover unless and until uh, the pandemic is uh, brought under control in, in the rest of the world. Uh, there's just with our trade ties, our supply chain links, our family ties, the idea that we can, as, as Donald Trump would have us do, build a moat around America, vaccinate everybody, and we're good, we're, we're off to the races in a, in a globalized economic world. That's just not the case. But COVAX also will right now is only slated to, to meet the needs of about 2 million people around the world. And so part of this global vaccine distribution initiative that I propose is also drawing on our bilateral relationships, our, the fact that we have now a little fewer than China, but mo almost more diplomatic posts uh, than any other country besides China around the world. We have our US aid, our CDC relationships. We did it on Ebola, yes, only in three countries. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, through the World Food Program and other international partners, the capillaries exist uh, mm -hmm. to be working again in developing countries that are so vulnerable. And this is their hour of need. You know, if we think about how we feel in the United States and we've got all of this uh, infrastructure uh, to tap into when we get proper leadership, that doesn't exist in so many parts of the world. And so for the United States to be at the forefront of that, working again side by side, hopefully with China, uh, and critically, of course, with our democratic partners in Europe and beyond, I think that's key. A second idea, which is requires really a very little budgetary attention, which is a plus in a, in a pandemic constrained budget environment, is to announce in a very dramatic way that our universities are back and open for business for international students. This has been a huge uh, boon for the American economy. And so again, it's not well known, but it's actually our sixth largest service sector export is international education. So it has that sort of domestic nexus, uh, given that, that again, our economy is hurting and people are hurting. But it also, as you know, Karen, is worth its weight in gold. 20% of African leaders today have some educational experience in an American university. When you get to an American university, you, you see what is on offer in terms of the intellectual capital, the d dynamism, the innovation, particularly in the science and tech space, but not only there. And this is an area where China has made large inroads and a major investment in actually luring foreign students away. At the same time, Donald Trump was pushing them away uh, with xenophobic rhetoric and with many more bureaucratic hurdles introduced that just make puts foreign students in limbo for much longer as they think through whether they can uh, get their paperwork in order. Last example briefly is in the corruption space. And I will say, Karen, I, I was struck when I sort of posted this article on Twitter and, you know, only summed up in much briefer way than I'm doing now what my my ideas, you know, these these sort of three initiatives, which are also aimed to just get the juices flowing in other people to think, okay, what are other things that will showcase this dimension of, of US soft power or our competence and our intellectual capital. But when I put corruption, the ridicule, right, just in shorthand, now people hadn't read the article, I presume, corruption, you know, who are we to, I get that, right? We're, we're coming out of uh, a four year period where we've had the most self-dealing uh, president in American history by far. And of course, there's going to be a huge amount of cleanup, try to institutionalize our norms, which we had thought were very sturdy, but of course have proven um, very much vulnerable to the whims and the and the financial, uh, personal financial interests of one man and his family, Donald Trump. So all of that is a backdrop, but that's precisely why, again, it we have the need to clean up domestically, but we also have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the Anti-Bribery Convention, even with Donald Trump in power, uh, we are still a country that enforces those laws through the Department of Justice and the SEC uh, more than most countries in the world. China doesn't do it at all. And many of its, uh, its sort of leading you know, business players have been, it appears, implicated in certain scandals, but there's not a lot of domestic corruption. And if you look at the protests, Karen, happening all around the world, about half of them, and last year was a record year in terms of popular protests, half of them are rooted in citizen concern about corruption uh, within their countries. And this is an Achilles, an Achilles heel 
uh, for the illiberal populists and other more autocratic figures who have really felt like they're on the march while democracy is in retreat and human rights are in retreat. This is a vulnerability for them. So investments in those actors internationally that are attempting to hold their governments accountable, meeting those citizens who are out on the streets where they are and showing that America is on the side of clean government and accountable government, I think can be another initiative. And again, is not a cost intensive one uh, in this difficult uh, environment with the pandemic. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I wanna start weaving audience questions into our conversation as well. And I have a question here from Dina Markhart, who's asking, what can the Biden-Harris administration do to safeguard some of the globally crucial policies, for example, on climate change, in case Biden is not reelected in 2024? Is starting a quick transition to renewable energy the only option? But broaden it beyond climate. How can the rest of the world have confidence that whatever Joe Biden puts in place will last beyond his administration? Well, I think one reason that so many people who support uh, who supported the Biden Harris ticket really wanted, uh, you know, the biggest margin possible was be able was to be able to meet the concern at the heart of that question uh, head on, right? To say, look, it wasn't just one man who lost this election; it was the ideology behind that man. So whether Trump runs again in twenty twenty four or Trump Junior or <laughs> Trump Light from somewhere else you know, that the American people have spoken, that kind of repudiation did not happen, even though Joe Biden's record shattering uh, popular vote totals and the margin between him and Trump is is unprecedented. Uh, all of that, you know, that, that kind of concern that this may uh, recur, I don't think has been abated. And so I think the question is a really fair one. Let me take climate as illustrative and then see if I can broaden out. So I think in that space, and this was happening in the last couple of years of the Obama administration, mm -hmm. but it wasn't entrenched enough, which is that you need to ensure that critical stakeholders, particularly in the private sector, are bought in such that irrespective of who the president is, the incentives cut in favor of continuing on the course that Biden has set, Biden Harris have set the country on. And so what's an example of that? So for example, under Obama, again, in the spirit of reducing carbon emissions, um, Obama had put in place the most um, uh, sort of uh, important, the strongest car rule uh, to ensure and insist that car companies uh, lower the emissions, and, or basically just the requirement that emissions uh, out of cars be much, much lower. So those came way down. The car companies were on board. They went out and they began to build different kinds of cars. Um, the reliance of those companies on those rules was incredibly important, such that when Trump came along and said, no, actually, I want more emissions from cars, uh, Many of the car companies protested and said, and said, look, we're already on this course. We're going to stay on this course. Now, Trump's rule, of course, doesn't say that you can't go lower. So actually, many of those companies are still proceeding. And indeed, California ended up doing a side deal with some of those companies because many of those companies deem it on brand to be showing the American people and the American consumers, as well as international consumers, that this is something that they have prioritized irrespective of what, in the case of Trump, the federal government uh, prioritized. And so I think that that is an example. And in starting on day one, uh, and bear in mind, President Obama's first term was very much consumed with the domestic financial crisis and the economic recession, and then the global financial crisis. And that linkage, uh, there was some linkage between the economic recovery and, and uh, you know, a, a prior version of building back better insofar as there were you know, green energy jobs embedded into the Recovery Act back in 2009, 2010, but nothing of the scale of ambition as what Joe Biden has in mind. So if you can think about all the private sector actors that hopefully will be bought in on day one, uh, by, you know, the end of your fourth year, you should be in a position where the business costs, the financial costs of them going back, mm -hmm. think of power plants, 
think of the aviation industry, uh, you know, think of a whole series of critical players and the investments they will need to have made uh, by the time uh, the, the next election occurs. I think the other dimension of this is as the polls have changed on climate with independent and swing voters, uh, and you can just see them shifting much, much more, even just over the course of the last year, in part because of young people and the pressure they are posing. Uh, the, those swing voters, independent voters, who Republicans will wish to get back, somehow making them an activated political force, and I'm making them is the wrong phrase, but, but ensuring, enlisting, you know, I don't know what the right verb is, but if they are become voices in the heads of Republicans who are thinking about their own self-interest, that becomes critically important. So how does one extrapolate out of them this climate reliance idea or the politicization of climate in a way where it becomes an important domestic political force? I think on every issue, you want to lock down as much reliance as possible. You want as much bipartisan buy-in, which in foreign policy actually you know, Trump really was an aberration with traditional Republican tenets. And so while there are dimensions maybe on immigration that many Republican leaders are going to want to take forward because they think there's something winning about that, uh, that's their view. I, I would wonder about that in terms of the long-term demographic trends in the United States, but that is their view. But in terms of NATO and investments in the international system and U.S. leadership, there are many Republicans who are deeply uncomfortable with what has happened. And then finally and related that swing voter, uh, the sort of middle of America, can they be, uh, uh, be be more of a force in even when Republicans are reluctant to throw their lot in with the new president? Uh, can that pressure from them cause the Republican Party to shift in perhaps only small but meaningful ways from the standpoint of ensuring enduring results and not the kind of results that can be torn up uh, by some future uh, potential president. So we're getting near the end of the session. And because this is the Berlin Foreign Policy Forum, I want to ask you, you've made clear that for Germany, for Europe, this is an administration that gives such prominence to ties to Europe, the partnership with Europe, and is an example of a return to multilateralism, things that Germany certainly welcomes. So what is it that Germany needs to do to take full advantage of these opportunities? And what are the expectations on the part of a Biden administration of a German government? Well, I won't characterize the Biden administration for obvious reasons, because uh, our friends um, and, and former colleagues, you know, will will figure that out. And, and there's a lot to work through. Um, but I think that, the you know, the prior question, which I suspect was on the minds of a lot of audience members today is, you know, how, basically, how can we trust these new new people? <laughs> how can we trust that we will tr we will trust we, and then we'll have our hearts broken again? You know, it's almost like. Uh, people who who have a rough romantic history. Uh, you know, I wrote a memoir uh, d documenting my own, so I could say I could say that that there are many of us out there. You know, and then how do you how do you learn to trust? I think that that people were really blindsided in 2016, and the JCPOA and Paris and the World Health Organization. All of that is going to remain salient for our European and other friends for a long time. But I, I do think that one can overthink this a little bit and lose precious time. That is, we now have an opportunity to build something really important together in a whole set of areas, right? And climate is an existential threat. I think it. Act, I, we have this great expression where, where I use with my kids, which is act as if, you know, or fake it till you make it, irrespective of you know, the trust issues that, that are that are out there and they're real. And I think you'll see a great humility in the way that Biden administration officials engage our European friends. So it's not as if people are going to come charging back, like, hey, high fives, we're back. Right. But but notwithstanding that trepidation that people understandably have over after the trauma of these last four years, we have to take this leap together. Now, that doesn't mean that Every European country, and I know Germany, this is very much on Germany's mind, you know, is forced to choose between the US and China. But I think we have to recognize that democratic values are under siege, not just in China, 
but by virtue of the vast uh, technological surveillance uh, equipment that's being exported, by virtue of the fact that human rights have been in retreat around the world for the last 14 years, by virtue of the fact that China has mobilized really powerful coalitions drawing on its economic leverage at the UN to chip away at the norms that we built together in the wake of the most devastating conflict in, the, in, in modern recorded history, World War II. So and I'm not saying we're going back to that, you know, happy, happy, you know, can't we all get along? You know, things have changed. China is a major player. But I do think recognizing the importance of shared values, notwithstanding the need, of course, to have tactical cooperation uh, where it's in a country's interest to do so, the Biden administration is certainly going to understand that. But I think the reason that, that the president-elect has prioritized democracies coming together is that, that that battle is a backdrop for, for not only the next four years, for, but for the coming decades, the battle between these two models. And I think to think that our fellow democracies in Europe don't have a dog in that fight and that we can only think about our economic returns and the economic relate, those are incredibly important, but they're also very brittle without that undergirding uh, uh, foundation of accountability. And that's for all of the flaws of in democracy. That's what, as why Churchill said, it's the worst form of government apart from all the others. And we have to recognize that it's in our interest to defend those values together. Well, that is a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Ambassador Power. What a delight to spend this half an hour with you. And I am gonna hand the floor back to our friends at the Karabach Stiftung. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen Dunfried. Thank you, Ambassador Power, for this fascinating conversation on US politics. And also a special thanks for putting a special emphasis on what Berlin can and should do right now. Thank you to Washington. Dear live stream viewers, we will now have a 50 minutes break before we continue with our interactive presentation of the Berlin Pulse, followed with, by our Kerber Global Leaders Dialogue with the Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez. So stay with us and we will be back in 50 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>